Hey. Thank you. I'm Emily Rose Yu, and I'm assistant professor in computer science department, and I direct the spatial temporal machine learning lab. So if you stare at the logo for a little bit, uh, you might spot out the, the letter S and T in this little rose, and that stands for spatial temporal. So the advancement in sensing technology gave rise to massive spatial temporal data. Um, and I'm a huge basketball fan. So for instance, in the 90 minutes basketball game, we have uh, sensors that can collect data in real time and we can collect about 2000 events in a 90 minutes game. So the question is uh, given such amount of data uh, in the order of millions, how can we you know, design machine learning algorithms that can analyze this data and help teams to find winning strategy? The second example is in the field of climate science. So climate models are important tools for us to understand the, and, and understand our mother earth. However, climate models are very complicated combined with observational data collected over the sphere. For example, this shows the climate uh, variation over the past 50 years. The question is, can we exploit such huge amount of data in climate science from both simulation as well as observation to better understand the climate atmospheric dynamics? Now, the common pattern among these examples is that the data generated from these domains can contain very rich space and time information. Hence, our lab's mission is to develop scalable machine learning algorithms that can analyze this kind of spatial temporal data. So com com compared with the traditional machine learning applications such as text data or image data, spatial temporal data pose unique challenges to existing machine learning algorithms. For example, one of the challenge is nonlinear dynamics. Uh, this is a hurricane picture and hurricane is a canonical example of nonlinear dynamics, meaning a small change in the beginning will lead to drastic difference when we run the system for a long time. And this is also known as a butterfly effect. So chaotic nonlinear dynamics are very difficult to simulate. They're sensitive to con initial conditions. The second challenge is non-Euclidean geometry. So if we look at you know, uh, the road sensor network, the sensors uh, deployed on this highway network is not like a regular grid, such as an image data. So it is very difficult to represent this kind of data in Euclidean geometry, right? And naturally our Earth is a sphere, so it, it requires other type of non-Euclidean non geometry to represent data in space and time. Uh, thirdly, um, spatial temporal data contains strong dependencies, not only across different uh, features, such as you know, the carbon dioxide measurements over temperature, but also there are strong dependencies across different timestamps and different locations. And this jointly contribute to higher order correlation. And we know that higher order structure often pose challenges to high dimensional models, and there is a course of dimensionality. So it's very difficult to learn. So this talk, the theme is for tensor methods, right? And I want to argue tensor methods are natural methods to model spatial temporal data because tensors generalize matrices and they can naturally encode higher order dependencies because they are higher order models by themselves. So in contrast to matrix models, which are linear operators, tensor models are multilinear mod operators and hence representing the nonlinear maps in our spatial temporal dynamics. Uh, in addition, there's also a rich family of tensor models such as CP decomposition or Tucker decomposition, even tensor train decomposition, which allows us to perform efficient dimension reduction. So nowadays in machine learning, most people would use deep learning to generate predictions because they're powerful in terms of representing unknown functions. However, I would also want to argue that deep learning models are very difficult to interpret. For uh, domain scientists, the predictions or the models from deep learning are very, are very difficult to make sense of. So tensor methods have this advantage with being a shallow model, even though it may not have the same type of prediction accuracy as deep learning models, but it enables interpretable models such that they can um, be useful to the domain science. 
So then in today's talk, I will focus on our recent ICML paper in 2020 on multi-resolution tensor learning. And in this paper, what we proposed is a new type of tensor learning algorithm that can generate interpretable uh, factors, right? So basically, given the trajectory data from a basketball game, and then we initiate tensor learning algorithms to generate heat maps that represent the behavior of different basketball plays. And these type of profiles can later be used by coaches to design better winning strategies. Um, just to motivate for an example, right? Let's say we wanted to predict um, the basketball player's shooting behavior. And in this case, we want to learn the player's shooting profiles. Um, so in this task, right, we're looking at the half court and this is the basket and this is the three point line. And so we're focusing on the ball handler, which is a red dot here. And the ball handler is surrounded by the defender. So we want to understand what is the behavior that this ball handler is going to perform while it's shooting a ball or not. And how is the presence of the defender going to change the behavior of this ball handler, right? And that's our task. So we are basically given the input as positions of the ball handler and the defender, and our output is the probability of a ball handler making the shot. So you can simplify this as a classification problem, essentially predicting whether this ball handler in red dot is going to make a shot. Given the position of the ball handler itself, himself and the defenders surrounding him, right? And then, Basically, the goal here is not really to make as accurate prediction as possible, but rather to learn the player profiles in the presence of the defender. So basically, we discretize these positions of the ball handler in this kind of spatial grid. And if we have a position of the ball handler X, as in 34.1, 40.7, we can assign a discretized value of uh, this position as a one hot encoding. So if we have a, for example, 10 by 10 grid, and this one hot encoding vector will be of a dimension of 10,000. And there's only one entry represent one, meaning that there is a point that is present in this grid cell. We can model basically this type of problem using a tensor latent factor model. Um, because we know that tensors can capture higher order correlation. And in this example, we want to capture the correlations among players, ball handlers, and the defenders. So compared with the regular tensor methods in machine learning, which is usually in an unsupervised setting, we're actually working with a supervised learning problem where we try to regress from the input, which is the positions of the ball handler, the positions of the defender, to the probability of this player, Y of A, making a shot. So this is a binary classification problem. If the label is one, that means it's taking a shot. And if it's not taking a shot, then the label is zero. So we associate the tensor weights, WABC, uh, for this regression model. Essentially, this regression model captures the high order correlation between every player A and the ball handler B, as well as the defender positions in C. So it's phi of X and psi of X represent, X is our spatial grid, right? Depending on the resolution, the dimension of X will change. Um, phi of B and psi of C represent the map from the spatial grid to the one hot encoding of the positions for ball handler and the defenders. And this tensor itself, WABC, can be extremely high dimensional depending on the resolution of the spatial grid. And therefore, to reduce the dimensionality, also to avoid the situation of model overfitting, we factorize this model tensor using a CT model. Essentially, we assume that this model tensor, WABC, can be factorized into three components. The matrix A represents the player shooting profile. So essentially, we assume there are k latent components, right? There are in total k different profiles for the player. So then every player will have k different shooting profiles. The, the matrix B represents the ball handler profiles over different spatial grids. 
and the matrix C represent the defender profile over the locations. And this is basically how we can model the high order correlation for basketball play. Let's also talk about an example in climate forecasting. Right? In this case, we want to understand how the precipitation in Northwest is going to change the crop yield in the United States. So, Wait, can I, can I be, before you go, can I ask a final question to your previous sure. slide? Do you have, um, because in the end you're fitting a, a probabilistic model, right? Do, do you have non-negativity constraints on the, on the factors or are they allowed to be any kind of numbers, the ABCs? Are they distributions, are they non-negative? Uh, so the non-negativity is only on like the outcome, which is, you know, right. we can squash a sigmoid function to make it as a probability. But the, the ABC itself are not constrained to be long. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Oops. Okay, so then let's talk about an example of climate prediction, right? And in this case, our input is the ocean variables represent the mostly sea surface salinity, sea surface temperature. Because their recent research in climate science has shown that oceanic variables such as sea surface salinity and sea surface temperature are significant predictors of the rainfall in landlocked locations such as US Midwest. So then in this case, what we wanna do is to forecast the average monthly precipitation in the Midwest which has significant impact on the crop yield uh, in that area. And our goal again is not to generate as accurate forecast as possible, but rather to understand the hidden structures in this uh, map to identify the latent factors underlying this type of climate processes linking the ocean and precipitation on the land. So, Again, we can use tensor models to capture the higher order correlation in these different type of variables. So there are time variables correlating to months and their ocean features, including salinity and temperature and their different locations, basically generating the measurements, right? We can build a similar multilinear regression model using supervised learning that maps from the tensor of X to the Y outcome. Right, the tensor X has three dimensions. The first one is the number of months, right? And it's using an autoregressive model and concatenating the measurements over several months. The second dimension corresponds to ocean features, including salinity, salinity and temperature. The third dimension is a location. We concatenate them into, we concatenate the locations in different uh, places in the West into the third dimension. And similarly, right, we're basically trying to predict from the ocean variable to the precipitation and precipitation is our outcome in Y. So again, we have a tensor uh, model W which models this type of multilinear map and we can factorize this tensor again into three components, right? We have basically three matrices with you know, in total K number of factors. So, the first matrix represents the temporal factor, uh, which captures the temporal periodicity in the latent space. And then the second matrix corresponding to the ocean features over locations, and the third one corresponding to the spatial factors. Right? And using these two examples, we can basically see um, the high level abstraction of linear regression basically allows us to model um, multilinear maps from input feature to output label, whether the output label is discrete or in the basketball prediction case or is continuous as in the climate forecasting case. And then the goal here is to learn our interpretable latent factors in the model W, right? That can be useful for downstream applications. So in here, because we're dealing with spatial data, Right, we have very specific meaning of how we can define interpretability. Right? Typically, when we think about interpretable on a spatial grid, we tend to think of the hotspots to clustered in the adjacent uh, location, which they form very smooth hotspots on the, on the, on the surface. Right? That's how we define interpretability in this context. Unfortunately, if we just run a simple tensor factorization model right, using SGD, it will not give us interpretable spatial factors, right? So if I take 
in a regular common tensor, tensor factorization algorithm and de decompose the W into three factors with the input feature phi of x and psi of x in order to predict the outcome, right? In the basketball case, the outcome will be whether the player is making a shot in the climate forecasting case will be the value of precipitation in the next month. So, um, the, the consequence of running a simple tensor factorization algorithm is that it will not generate integral factors. In fact, when we look at the latent factors over space, it pretty much like look like a random noise on the space. So the latent factors are not useful in using simple tensor learning algorithms. This is mainly because the tensor models are non-convex as discussed by other uh, speakers as well. And therefore the non-convex objective function is very sensitive to the initial condition. If we're unlucky where we start a very, with a very bad initial condition then the solution we find are not interpretable in the spatial context. So the key contribution of this work is to pro propose a new type of algorithm that allows us to generate interpretable latent factors. The key idea is to initialize our latent factors with full rank model, right? So we basically split the tensor learning uh, algorithm into two stages. One is called pre-training. The other one is called fine tuning. Pre-training stage give us a very good initialization, which we later will show is critical to generate interpretable latent factors. In the fine tuning stage will basically use the, like, the initialization from the pre-training stage and factorize it into low rank models. So initialization step will use a full rank model and then we will factorize at the end after we finish the pre-training step. The, the fine tuning stage will factorize, will train on the model in, in a low rank kind of fashion, right? But naturally when you think about learning a full rank tensor model, right? Because our dimension is huge for basketball, the corresponding to number of grid cells in the basketball court. So we have to use scalable algorithms to speed up this type of process. And the key idea behind this kind of process is multi-resolution. So for both the pre-training stage and the fine tuning stage, because we're working with spatial data, it allows us to directly fine grain along the spatial dimension from initial coarse grain to the fine grain resolution. And we can always use the solution from the coarse grain resolution as an initialization to the next resolution. So we can repeat this kind of fine graining process iteratively such that we are not training on the finest resolution alone, but instead we can do this iteratively to speed up the process. With the multi-resolution learning, we can apply the same strategy to the pre-training stage as well as the fine-graining stage. The difference is that in the pre-training stage, we're fine-graining on the full tensor, as you can see on this picture, whereas in the fine-graining stage, we're fine-graining on the latent factors, as seen on the, on the other picture. So there's a question remains is how do we define the fine graining criteria, right? In practice, we have experimented with a lot of variations. Uh, and simple one is basically rely on the validation loss. So if we look at the validation loss in our prediction problem, because we are dealing with a supervised learning problem. So we can look at the validation loss, a difference between the loss from the previous iteration and the current iteration T. And if it's smaller than certain threshold, we can find grain to the next resolution. Um, but it may not be the best criteria. So in this case, we also explore some other alternatives. One of them is based on the information theory criteria, basically looking at the distribution of the stochastic gradients. Right, because we're using stochastic gradients to train our model, for every sample i, we can compute a stochastic version of the gradient by taking the loss function with respect to the weight parameter at that iteration for the specific example i. And this gives us an, a noisy estimate of the gradient for that particular example. The high level idea that we want to use the gradient statistic as a fine gradient criteria is that we think you know, the distribution of the gradients basically carries information of how much you know, the data we can learn from. So if basically there is no 
uh, there is a clear separation in this kind of distribution of gradients, then we basically means there is a very little and there's little very little diversity we can learn from. There is no information we can learn from at the current iteration, and therefore we need to fine grain it into separate resolutions. So this is a fine graining criteria we came up with just through experimentation. And because we cannot compute the entropy directly, so we came up with different approximations to estimate the entropy approximately. And we can also look at basically the standard deviation of this kind of distribution, as well as a combination of standard deviation and the mean value of this kind of distribution. So in this paper, we basically proved a couple of things. One is that using multi-resolution, we can show that this algorithm converges under standard, standard stochastic gradient descent uh, assumptions. So essentially, if we have a optimization problem W, right here, we simplify them to a one-dimensional weight W as a vector, but this, this theorem applies to multi-dimensional tensors. The idea is that we want to learn a W that minimize the empirical risk over this function class F where we some stochasticity encoded in C as a random sampling. So the key idea in the proof is to rely on the interpolation operator P. Because we're using fine graining to transit from one resolution of the spatial grid to the other. So the grades basically are copied from let's say a one point to two point in one dimension. So this kind of copying operation Represent can be represented as an interpolation operator. And obviously, we can come up with different type of interpolation scheme, but it can also be always be formulated as this interpolation operator that maps the weights from previous resolution to the next. So if we assume that you know this map interpolation operator has relatively normal behavior where the difference in terms of weights between the coarse resolution and the fine resolution is bounded, then under the standard SGD assumption, we can show that this algorithm does converge with similar uh, rates as SGD, but there is a slightly difference from the regular SGD uh, rates, which the resolution, the rates of this multi-resolution SGD actually depend on the operator norm of this interpolation operator P. Um, and the other thing we proved is the computation of flux complexity, right? Because the, the idea of using multi-resolution is basically speed up the convergence of higher order tensor models. So we can show that uh, using multi-resolution optimization, we can achieve exponential computational speed up compared with fixed resolution op optimization step. So we can show this using fixed point iteration method. Basically, we can roughly uh, think about the uh, gradient descent as a fixed point iteration, where if we bound this fixed, fixed point iteration operator with a contraction factor gamma, then assume the fine gradient tier criteria depends on the re resolution itself, D of R, we can show that the multi-resolution tensor learning algorithm is much faster than the fixed resolution algorithm with a logarithmic factor. So this logarithm factor depends basically on the contraction factor gamma as well as the termination estimation error. And the key idea in the proof to show the speed up is leveraging the technique from multi-grid optimization and basically repeat the contraction factors at different resolution. So experimentally, we showed that our method is much faster than the fixed resolution, both for the pre-training stage as well as the fine-tuning stage. So for pre-training stage, we're learning a full rank model and for the fine tuning stage, we're learning a low rank model. For both stages, we can so show that the F1 score over a number of seconds, our multi-resolution model is much faster. Different vertical lines representing different fine graining stages. So each of the, each between these different vertical lines represent a particular resolution of the tensor model. We also look at the effect of different fine graining criteria. Like for example, we looked at the validation loss, the norm of the stochastic gradient, the variance and entropy of the stochastic gradient. What we found is that 
in the full rank model, actually the validation loss converges much faster than the other criteria. However, for the low rank model in the fine tuning stage, the other stochastic gradient statistics based methods are slightly faster than the validation loss criteria. Um, the key point in this, in this paper is to show interpretability. As I mentioned before, if we run a simple tensor factorization method, we will obtain random initial, random, with random initialization, then we will obtain latent factors that look like a noise. But if we use multi-resolution tensor learning algorithm, we can see that the model learns from a much better initialization point, and therefore the latent factors start to form cohesive spatial patterns, and they are much more interpretable. So we can show the latent factors learned by the model for the basketball game. For example, if we look at the ball handler, we can see that it forms cohesive, coherent spatial patterns. And especially this kind of patterns can, can represent the known location on, on the three-point line and close to the basket. It's more obvious if we look at the relative defender position, where we can see that uh, the concentrated area, this is the basket, this is the ball handler. We can see that the close area, the close position of the ball, the, the defender will basically suppress uh, the shot probability of the ball handler. Uh, sometimes the latent factors also shows the rationality as well, meaning that guarding from one side of the ball handler actually press the suppressor shot probability more than the other side. If we look at the climate data, we can also see interpretable spatial patterns, especially in the Northwest Atlantic region, right? And we know that this latent factors basically can correspond to the region of the ocean, which influences the precipitation most, especially in the Gulf of Mexico and Northwest of the Atlantic. And this makes sense because uh, the precipitation is mainly driven by the moisture export from these areas. And therefore we see highlights learned by the model. And interesting, these findings are actually consistent from, with the research published in climate science venues as well. So to conclude, we basically proposed a new type of tensor learning algorithm called multi-resolution tensor learning. It leverages full rank tensor to obtain good initialization for tensor optimization. It uses multi-resolution strategy to speed up the optimization process. We can show that this algorithm generates more interpretable factors for spatial data in terms of future work. We're interested in understanding why certain fine-graining criteria have different behavior, especially the gradient statistic-based criteria. And we're also interested in generalize the current regular mesh to adaptive mesh grid. Uh, you can check out the code and the data on my website or follow me on Twitter. And I would like to thank the sponsor for supporting this work. Thank you. <laughs>